Well, I'm showing 1205, Thursday, June 11th. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today for our webinar for California Invasive Species Action Week. We will give you some brief introductions and a little bit of instruction on the best, how to get the most out of your webinar experience here. Um, I will introduce our moderators, starting with myself. This is Doug Johnson with the California Invasive Plant Council, a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to protecting the state's natural areas, um, environment and economy from invasive plants. And joining me is my colleague, Yuta Berger from Calypsi as well. And not shown on this slide, uh, today we have Dana Morowitz as well from Calypsi helping us out. Um, do you each want to say hello quickly? Hello, hello. Glad to be here. This is Utah. Hello, hello from Dana too. Thanks so much. And Sabrina Drill from the University of California's Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources, um, who is a co-organizer of this series, is actually our speaker today. So she has an elevated role. Um, and we'll hear a little bit about uh, UCANR from her and her talk. So some quick webinar tips. Um, if you are in full screen view and you need to get out of it because you need to do something else on your computer, use the escape key, typically at the top left of your keypad. Um, you may be seeing a box um, of presenters over on the top right of your screen. That box, you can click on it and hold and move it around if it's blocking something that you wanna see on the screen. You can also use, um, there are a few controls up at the top left of it that can control whether you see that box at all or if you just see the current speaker or if you see all of the panelists. Um, and then at the bottom, um, if you take your cursor and hover near the bottom of your screen, you should have a toolbar that pops up. It will have less options than the one shown here, but the two that are important to you are the Q and A um, button which is where you can click and type in a question for Sabrina, our speaker today, on what she's talking about. Um, or under the chat button, that's where you can type in if you are having any technical difficulties that you need Dana's help with. Um, Dana is monitoring the chat line and um, Utah is monitoring the Q&A line today. Also, if you have uh, just brief comments you want to make to other presenters or panelists, um, the chat line is the place to do that. Um, this week's schedule, and I tell you the ones that have already happened both out of interest, but also because all of these presentations are being recorded and will be posted um, at the UCANR website where the Invasive Lunch series is hosted. And the simplest way to go there rather than trying to remember a URL is to Google Invasive Lunch or use whatever browser you use and search for Invasive Lunch. That's where you could register for tomorrow's talk if you, uh, if you want to on Phytophthora soil pathogens. And once we get them posted, it's also where you can see this year's recorded talks um, as well as from the previous two years of recorded talks. You will not, just as a further follow-up to the previous slide, the chat box and the Q&A um, box are your opportunities for dialogue. Um, because this is a webinar, the attendees do not have the ability to share their screen or audio. So the poll asked a couple of questions. Um, I am going to end the polling now. Thank you to all of those who responded. And I am going to share the results. So you should be able to see on the screen now that we have 93% uh, of our attendees are from California today. We've got 5% from other states and 2% from folks outside of the country. Thanks for joining us. And in terms of how familiar people are with the invasive species issue, we've got quite a mix. We've got 44% who are very familiar, perhaps they're in the field of, of conservation. But we've got 41% um, that are fairly familiar and 15% who are not very familiar at all. And we really appreciate you joining us. That is a main goal of this webinar series is to um, 
reach out to people um, in California and elsewhere uh, to make sure that this major issue that affects biodiversity, affects natural resources that we all depend on, is an issue that we're, um, we're all familiar with. So I am going to let my colleague Yuta um, introduce our speaker today, Sabrina Drill. Thanks, Doug. So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Sabrina. Um, Sabrina, uh, Dr. Sabrina Drill is a uh, natural resource advisor for UC Co Cooperative Extension for LA and Ventura counties. If you have had anything to do with pest species, um, vertebrate, invertebrate, pathogens in Southern California, you have probably met Sabrina already. She does a tremendous amount of work down there. So she works on all things restoration and invasive species related uh, in both terrestrial and aquatic environments, uh, and mostly on non-plants, non I would say. <laughs> you can correct me if I'm wrong, Sabrina, but that's how I know you. Um, and she's also really interested in public participation and uh, in science and resource uh, stewardship. Um, recently, she served as associate director and the Southern California lead for UC, uh, for the UC Naturalist program, where she's been especially interested in engaging underserved communities in conservation and management. So uh, without further ado, Sabrina. Hello, everyone. And um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the reins here, right? Yes, please. Okay. And Sabrina is joining us all the way from, are you in Norman, Oklahoma? I am in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, Excellent. And I'm on sabbatical right now, actually, from um, my role with Cooperative Extension. And I'm focusing actually on um, using urban nature to increase resiliency of um, cities and communities. So, yeah. Um, as Doug mentioned, I'm with UC Cooperative Extension, which is part of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of California. Hopefully um, you've been with us previously, so you've heard this before, but um, we have offices in every county in California with a suite of advisors like myself. Um, so in the Ventura office, we have our avocado guy and our strawberry guy. Um, a lot of us do work with crops. I'm a natural resources advisor um, and I work with habitat restoration and groups who are doing that. And we also run the 4-H program, Master Gardeners and California Naturalist, as well as um, the UC Integrated Pest Management or IPM program, which is also a great source of information about a lot of this. But I'm gonna get maybe a little philosophical today and I want to talk about where invasive species fit in in the overall idea of restoration using urban rivers. I'm a fish biologist by background and I do a lot of work on the LA River, which is what I'll focus on today, but using urban rivers as a model. But a lot of what I'm going to be saying is um, applicable in other kinds of contact contexts as well. So many of you may be familiar with sort of the legal definition of invasive species. They're non-native to the ecosystem and their introduction causes economic or environmental harm. Um, they can be plants, animals, microbes. They might be competitors, predators, pests, pathogens. Um, and they have a significant impact on native species um, and a significant economic impact. Generally, we think about um, the species that are invasive as having some characteristics there. A lot of times they like disturbance, especially weed species. Um, they have high reproductive rates and short generation times. And really they're able to thrive under local climatic and soil and various conditions so that if they're, say for a weed, if they're planted in a garden, they're the plants that can get out and cause problems in adjacent wild areas. Um, but I want to kind of take a look at some of the terminology that we use. So I mentioned before that exotic and non-native species come from another place. But part of that means that being exotic or invasive is really a location-based characteristic. It's not 
some intrinsic characteristic of these species. The species aren't bad unto themselves. And I'll give you some examples to go into that a little bit more. Naming a species invasive or noxious is a political act, um, hopefully guided by good science. And I'm not saying that in a, um, a, a critical or confrontational way. It just literally is a political act. There's a series of laws that regulate um, responses to invasive species, and there's a political um, process and decision making about officially deciding that a species is going to be considered invasive, which then means there might be certain funding streams or regulations that come into play that can help um, deal with them. Invasive species, again, not all exotic or non-native species are invasive. It's the ones that cause ecological or economic harm that are considered invasive, but those are kind of value statements. Um, certainly we can talk about harm in a very scientific way and we can figure out some set measures, but it really does come down to how are we measuring harm and how do factors like habitat alteration also cause harm. Um, you guys may have seen some of these um, um, charts before as well. I got these from the um, Health Fish and Wildlife uh, site. Stages of bi biological invasion, and I think you should be able to see my cursor now that I can kind of use as a pointer here. So we talk about, you know, the species arrives, but maybe we could prevent it from arriving. If it gets there, maybe we can eradicate it if we get in early. Whoops. Um, and again, this kind of this kind of gives you a timeline here, right? They're introduced, they're detected, maybe we can eradicate them. Then public awareness begins as they reproduce and spread and start to cause problems and displace natives, and then we need to control them. But this, again, really focuses on the species itself. Um, while what we're really looking at is how these species are functioning in ecosystems, and much of the time, the ecosystems and the habitats that, that get invaded are already degraded or encroached on or have suffered a serious reduction in, um, in amount and area that they um, cover. And that has a lot to do with this. So one of the things um, to think about is, is it really only because never before had that species been introduced into that environment that we suddenly see a problem. So I want to shift it and talk about the ecosystem itself and how some ecosystems have an increase in invasibility in, in their um, sensitivity to an invasive species coming in. So a lot of times in these habitats, physical conditions have changed. We may have a problem with connectivity to water flow upstream and downstream in aquatic systems or um, areas with other kinds of soil conditions or to um, surrounding refugia that are on protected lands or across ecological webs as Rachel kind of talked about yesterday. Um, maybe there's some disconnection going on and changes in in certain regimes that happen like um, whether uh, different species within the ecosystem are kind of hooked together in terms of the timing of when certain things happen, like blooming and pollination, we call that phenology. Maybe there's also been changes in precipitation or fire regimes that are affecting, again, how invasible these um, ecosystems are. Deposition of pollutants and nutrients and other things that we're adding, and then temperature changes whether that's, you know, the broad temperature changes due to global climate change or it's local temperature changes um, due to other things. I'll give some examples of that. And then species introduction itself and whether, um, whether there's other invasive species already present that, you know, again, this is something that Rachel talked about a little bit. You might have one species come in. It doesn't start to establish until its uh, bacterial symbionts also arrive. And we have entire sort of invasive biomes coming into areas. So it's really important to address invasibility and support ecosystem resilience and not 
while pre preventing and removing and managing invasive species can be incredibly important. If we're not already addressing other sources of degradation in the system, they might just become invaded again. And we're, we're you know, treating a symptom and not the underlying health of the ecosystem. Um, Doug, do you want to launch that poll? I'm just curious to see how many of you are familiar with Nile Perch and the story of Lake Victoria. This will, I'm, maybe I'm launching the poll. I'm not sure if you can. Oh, there we go. Um, so we'll just give you a minute to think about this, um, whether you're familiar again with the story of Nile Perch or the story of what happened in Lake Victoria. And while I work in California now, I actually uh, did my PhD dissertation in um, East Africa. Okay, so only a few people have heard about it. Um, so Nile perch is a species of fish that's native to rivers throughout Africa, um, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, but also up through the Nile Basin. Um, and in 1954, they were introduced to Lake Victoria. And there's been a lot of popular press, National Geographic specials. Um, there was a really great documentary called Darwin's Nightmare that kind of talks about, um, talks about this. But the species was introduced to Lake Victoria in 1954 intentionally to um, provide an avenue for economic development for the area because it's a really popular exportable food fish. You can see how big it is up in the corner there. And in the 1980s, um, there was evidence that the, it had decimated hundreds of cichlid species because Lake Victoria is also an area where there's been an adaptive radiation, kind of like the Galapagos and the finches there, but with cichlid fish. So hundreds of these species were lost. But it's interesting to note that there's a pretty long lag phase between the 1950s and the 1980s. And what had happened is the lake, um, so Nile perch was introduced, but there was a lot of emphasis on um, development work and the green revolution in these years, um, a little later into the early 60s. And there was a lot of intensification of agriculture around the lake too, which led to a lot of soil runoff and fertilizer runoff and what we call eutrophication, where because of the growth of algae and a few other processes, oxygen levels are lowered. And it turns out that these cichlid fish um, were able to handle lower oxygen levels than this very large perch. But as the oxygen levels were reduced, they were all sort of pushed up into the um, near the surface waters where the Nile perch was. So um, it's just interesting to think about. I recommend that, that film, Darwin's Nightmare, if you haven't seen it. Um, um, and there's a lot of debate over, was this a success or a failure, ecologically and economically. And in the 1970s, they were also introduced into Texas. Um, but they, so far, they really haven't taken off there. So again, same species, native in some areas, invasive in some areas, introduced but not invasive in other areas. So I'll give you another just couple of examples I'm going to run through. If I click back onto here, here we go. Um, mosquito fish are another example. Um, mo many of you may know them now as an invasive species in streams throughout California um, and throughout the West. They're native to the Mississippi River, so they are U.S. native and other Gulf watersheds. Um, and they were introduced really as an environmentally friendly way to deal with mosquitoes. So instead of using chemical pesticides, hey, we're going to use these fish and we're going to use an ecosystem service. It turns out they displace native species, they affect native invertebrates, and they actually don't eat that many mosquitoes. They'll eat other stuff before mosquito larvae um, if it's present there. So again, sort of a complicated situation. And the last one I'm going to talk about actually is rainbow trout. Um, and I'll talk, I'll be talking a lot more about Oncorhynchus minkus, keep that species name in mind, um, a little later in the talk. So these are native to the northeastern Pacific Ocean, so essentially um, Mexico up through um, um, Alaska and into Russia. They've been introduced all over the world for recreation and tourism, super popular um, fish to angle for. 
Um, they're considered invasive. Well, they're considered a uh, trophy fish and considered invasive in areas in um, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia um, because they do impact native fish species there. And in California, it's interesting because uh, we're about to talk about we have an endangered Oncorhynchus mycus population and potentially an invasive one. And one of the things that happens is when we're introducing fish species out of hatcheries, we might introduce them with parasites and the fish on the bottom here, the young par over here on the bottom um, are affected by whirling disease, which is a, a fungal disease that may have come in with um, the introduction of hatchery fish. So focusing in on the LA River a bit more, um, it's a pretty big watershed for Southern California, 51 miles. The upper watershed's mostly in protected areas in Angeles National Forest. And it's naturally flashy, which if you are in Southern California, you know what flashiness is. It's the fact that we don't get rain, you know, 50 weeks out of the year. And then in two weeks, we can get torrential rains that cause floods. So that means that water levels in naturally flashy rivers there's a natural history of those water levels um, varying widely. There's a couple massive dams. Um, most of the river, as you can see in the picture behind here, is um, channelized into a storm drain, or most of the middle and lower sections of the river that you think about through, say, the city of LA. And it's slated for a pretty large restoration project, which has some really neat positives um, that I'm really excited about that also is driving gentrification in this area. So lots of stuff going on. The upper watershed has cool, um, fast flowing water with a lot of oxygen. It's got a nice riparian canopy, um, although there's a lot of problems with invasive plants um, in the upper watershed, especially things like vinca. Um, it's got a gravel substrate, um, in-stream boulders, undercut banks, and a fair amount of woody debris. And these are all features that are important for um, steelhead habitat. The midwater hab habitat has lower velocities and a lot of off-stream pools, less um, riparian shading. It has a, lot, a little more mud and silt in the substrate, some sand, not all gravel. Um, and it's marked by intermittent flow, which means that there are sections of the watershed that naturally would go dry for much of the year. Um, I'm not going to talk about all the native fishes of the river, um, but I will talk a little bit more, as I mentioned, about Oncorhynchus mycus. Um, but these are just a list of some of the species that could be found there, um, including this guy, Southern Steelhead, which you may have heard about, um, again, in a restoration context. So this is, this is the same species as the rainbow trout that could be invasive that I talked about before. But here we're talking about native populations that are anadromous, which means that they're fish like other salmon. They're in the family Salmonidae. And like other salmon you might be familiar with, they um, um, spawn in the upper watershed where there's lots of gravel and cool water. But then they go out through the middle and lower portions, out through the estuary, and spend about seven to 10 years living in the ocean before they return. Um, the southern population is highly endangered, really close to being extirpated. Um, and in order to survive, they need connectivity from the upper watershed to the ocean and cool water and clean gravel. So if you think about a fish trying to get into the LA River, first they get through one of the, they have to get through one of the largest port complexes in the world. Um, then they have to swim through many, many miles of channelized stream. There's a few areas where the banks are channelized, but they actually have a soft bottom and some, a mix of native and invasive riparian vegetation. So there's a lot of willows, but also a lot of arundo. Um, so a lot of issues with the weeds there. Then they're going to hit more channelized areas, eventually bonk their heads on one of these large dams, um, unless we choose to do something about this. And then if they could get all the way up there, there's some nice spawning areas until they reach what we call the natural limit of anadromy, say a waterfall 
So when we think about the LA River, we can ask what habitat should be there? But again, should is a, um, it's kind of a loaded question, right? Do we, if we want to restore this, did, do we want to restore it to historic condition, which means allowing for massive scale flooding. The reason it was channelized in the first place was because of um, loss of property and life in several large floods in the late 1930s. Um, so are we going to restore these huge floodplains or not? Um, probably not. <laughs> But there are areas where we could restore some of the function of the ecosystem. So we have to deal with the physical realities and, okay, what could we really do in the LA River in terms of restoration? And then what do we still as a society and as a big city need um, in terms of water storage, flood, um, dealing with flooding, um, protecting water quality and dealing with some of the issues there and recreation and just access to nature. Um, so again, these are all part of deciding what habitat should be there. And um, this is a, the, the picture on the left is um, of a 25 inch steelhead caught near Glendale in 1940, um, showing us that yes, this river did support steelhead in the past, even after a lot of the channelization was done in the 30s. Picture on the right is what you more commonly see in these sections of the LA River now, nice big fat fusion carp. Um, okay, so changes to the river. So there's a couple different things that we see and this map here just shows you if you can't, you don't necessarily need to read all of these different land uses, but just note that anything that isn't green on here essentially isn't quote unquote natural habitat. Um, so some of the changes to this river, we now have year round water because um, there are several water reclamation plants along the river that collect water we use in our homes, um, purify it to a pretty, um, pretty extensive degree, and then put it back in the river. And so we have water in there in the summer because we're still using water all year round, not just when the rain falls. And then urban drool is the runoff that just comes across the surface and brings whatever junk that was on that surface with it. We have channelization that we talked about, dams, and also velocity barriers. So if a fish is trying to move up a river and the, there's, so salmon, you probably have seen videos of salmon making these amazing jumps or dealing with these extreme conditions. And they can do that, but they can only do it if they also have periods and areas where they can rest in between. So when the velocity is just the same for miles and miles, they'll become exhausted. And, and really low on metabolic resources. We have pollutants and nutrients coming in and we have increased temperatures. And that all sort of leads to these other issues, loss of habitat variety. So you can go down to some of the soft bottom session, um, sections and you'll see what fish biologists call pools, ripples, and runs, different kinds of depth and flow and substrate. And those provide different functions in the ecosystem loss of vegetated banks or where we have vegetated banks, they may have been taken over by weeds. Um, and then of course, species introduction in addition to the fish species, but also including the fish species. What that lack of disturbance means, if you think about it, Southern California river species are adapted to those flashy conditions and intermittent streams. So in those conditions, they'll have a competitive advantage over these non-native species. But when you have this year round water coming in and it's warmer water as well, and with less shading, and you also are disconnecting by channelization, you're not just disconnecting sort of in terms of um, side to side or upstream and downstream with dams, you're also disconnecting the river from underground springs that would provide cooling. So we have warmer water and year round water, and that makes this a lot better for a whole suite of what we call warm water species. This obviously isn't a fish, it's a, um, it's a, um, a bullfrog tadpole, but that's another important exotic and I will say invasive species in the LA River. Um, and they then have a competitive advantage under these new conditions. Channelization itself, 
as I mentioned, there's loss of variation in depth, flow, and substrate. Um, loss of the native riparian species, so there's less shade. There's less of the undercut banks that you often get when willows are the dominant species, and, and fish really like to hide under those banks. Um, and they like to hide under that large woody debris. So you're losing connection with upland vegetation types as well. So sort of that lateral connection, which may be more important for some of our um, amphibian and reptile aquatic species than it is for fish. We have changes in water chemistry. We have all these nutrients and increased sunlight hitting the water and warmth both from that sunlight hitting and because we have all this runoff coming in and that favors algal growth which drops oxygen levels, and then you get a change in the benthic invertebrates to what we call more tolerant species and maybe not the preferred prey species for our native fish. So I'm going to talk to you just briefly about research that was done over um, about a decade from 2008 to 2018, where we did a whole series of surveys of fish in the LA River in several different areas. Um, Let's go back again, sorry, just for a minute. So we did several surveys in what I mentioned before, the soft bottom river sections in the Glendale Narrows. And then we went back in 2014 and also added samples. So I'm not sure if I'm going up enough here, but also added samples around Sepulveda Dam, behind the dam, and then um, in the estuary towards Long Beach. We started out with traditional fishery survey methods like seining and using traps, but it doesn't work that well in any rocky stream, but especially where you then have a whole bunch of trash on the bottom. Um, and it, you don't catch carp very well that way. So we needed to try angling, so hook and line fishing, which the surprising number of fish biologists, including myself, are not very good at. So we started working with the community and that was really neat. And there's, if people wanna ask questions about what it, what it sort of means in other senses to work with the community, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q and A. But um, in part, we did this just because we needed people who knew how to fish, who could catch the fish for us. So we did several things. We had volunteer angler events. This is in Long Beach from one of our, um, working with some fishing clubs who we invited to come down on a specific day and do kind of a bio blitz. We held with Friends of the LA River these um, fishing derbies um, where we actually had contests for, you know, the largest fish or the most number of species um, and a whole series of folks and a, the state parks came out to some of those and taught people how to fish along with a lot of fishing clubs. That was really neat. And then we're also using something called iNaturalist, which is kind of an online tool to collect observations so that people who are fishing in the river can and tell us what they're catching anytime, not just at these events. Um, so this is a table just showing you all of the different surveys that we conducted and what we found, including the iNaturalist data um, and the derbies and everything. And if you're familiar with fish species, one of the things you'll note is we found one native freshwater fish, literally not just one species, one fish um, in all of the surveys that we conducted, the California killifish, and we found a few native um, estuarine species down in the estuary, but still the numbers were small. So what were our final results? Well, we found 18 taxa, um, 14 of which are non-native, and, and really um, if you get rid of the three natives in the estuary, you can essentially say we no longer see native fish species in the um, portion of the LA River that's predominantly channelized. Instead, what we have is a warm perennial water fish community of fish from the Southeast US, from Africa, from Asia, from South America, from tropical areas. So we know we have an exotic fishery or non-native fishery, but then we still have to ask ourselves, mm, is that invasive or not? Because, you know, for the LA River, some of you, I probably should have put another poll in here, but some of you may be surprised, let us know in the chat if you are, that we even found all these fish in the LA River. And when I say healthy fish populations, not only did we catch a lot of fish, several thousand fish, um, but the fish themselves seemed relatively healthy. 
but essentially no native species in the channelized portions. So that's poor by most conservation standards. So we went in and also wanted to test a hypothesis that temperature was something, in addition to sort of the channelization that we could readily see, um, that temperature was something that had um, been severely impacted in the river. And not surprisingly, what we found is there were a few areas where there were springs um, still uh, making water available, or they were um, right at the edge of national forest, um, where we had pool water, water we would expect as sort of native um, to these areas. And then there were many, many areas that were very, very warm. So where a maximum temperature was over 30 degrees, which is uh, 30 degrees Celsius, which trust me is very, very warm for um, a native river. And then we had some areas um, that were interesting, but oh, this is pointing out that soft bottom section right there. And then we did have some areas um, up in the San Fernando Valley, up in um, Angeles Forest and down by the estuary where we would call the water on the warm side, but not necessarily hot. And we can compare that to what we know the thermal temperature limits are for some of our native species. Um, there's a lot in here talking about Omicus. Again, I can answer questions about that if people have them, but um, we found that, so omicus that are acclimated to warm temperatures in a laboratory setting can handle temperatures up to 32 degrees. And we also found them in streams like Malibu Creek and other areas where they were existing at least in relatively warm waters. But this is what's traditionally for the entire range of the species considered um, a good up, a low end of an upper temperature for steelhead. Most people will tell you 24 degrees is the is the upper maximum. And then San Ana sucker and three spine stickleback, some of the other native species in there. And you can see all of these points are well above the thermal limits for any of these native species. So what does that mean for restoration? Restoring fish passage to channelized reaches is gonna be really important so that fish can get to some of the cooler refugia and then working to make sure that those cooler refugia areas actually do have cool water is gonna be important. Um, and there's actually a new project just starting up right now with the Council for Watershed Health and Stillwater Sciences to look at, um, and the city of Los Angeles, sorry, to modify channels, adding things like embedding um, cobble into the substrate so that there is a little more change and creating some off-stream pools. We can improve the water quality in address invasive plants like a rundo to see if we can restore um, banks, try to figure out other ways to lower the temperature in the river, um, and then removing exotic species. But I think the point here is that there's only a very few cases in which you can restore um, an ecosystem. Islands, actually, what we heard about on Tuesday might be one of those cases where you have protected island habitats in Mexico or in the US um, in the California Channel Islands where you remove the exotic species and you can gain a lot. But in, in most of our more urban or wildland urban interface ecosystems, just removing exotic species isn't going to leave you with a healthy habitat. Um, Again, this was research that was conducted over a period of 10 years with many, many partners, um, particularly, um, these are listed in, in order from one of the studies here, but particularly um, my co-authors on the study were the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains, Rosie Daggett and um, Cal State LA, and Andres, um, Andy Aguilar at Cal State LA and his students. But then a whole bunch of other groups either funded our work or collaborated on it and um, oh I just wanted to mention that you can um, find all of the, the scientific studies that I mentioned and links to some of the pro uh, restoration projects that I talked about um, at my website um, science for restoring the LA River so you don't need individual links to each of these they're all compiled there and um, with that, I'm ready for some, some discussion and some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Sabrina. That's really um, uh, 
really a different, a different take on restoration right there in the, the heart of downtown Los Angeles. Um, I would love to just ask, I think your last slide there on restoration really left me hanging with the question of what is a suitable conservation outcome? What are we going for? Because on the one hand, <laughs> you've got, as you described, a native um, steelhead run that is nearly gone. And it would be, on one hand, really nice to restore conditions. And you listed a lot of those conditions <laughs> um, to making that happen. At the other hand, you've got a bunch of fish living in the river now with the existing conditions. Is it, you know, maybe it's easier to just go with that. Like what, what goes into making the decision? Who, who makes the decision? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of groups involved in making these decisions. So one thing that I really love that the city of LA has done um, for their part in all of these projects, and they really have shown a great deal of leadership on um, these projects, especially in say the past decade or so, um, is they're calling their program revitalization of the LA River. And that means it's a combination of ecological restoration, um, economic development along the corridor, um, and restoring access for um, residents of Los Angeles and visitors for anyone in Los Angeles to get down to the river. And that's been really neat too. When I first started doing this work, um, people were fishing at the LA River. They it was totally legal and still is to fish in the LA River with a California fishing license. You do need the license. And there are a bunch of people, you know, dressed in their Orvis gear out there, um, um, just kind of keeping their chops up for their, you know, annual trip to Idaho or whatever. Um, and with their, like, their, uh, their permit showing and there'd be a bunch of people who um, usually were very recent immigrants or there's a large homeless population who were fishing probably without permits um, and licenses and um, and doing so for subsistence or for food and um, it was really interesting because at the time um, city of LA parks this is the area right along Griffith Park started issuing um, loitering tickets to people who were fishing. And loitering is one of those crimes that like restoration, <laughs> like invasive, it's a pretty subjective definition. And now we see a complete turnaround and it's, it's really exciting that there's kayak, recreational kayaking on the LA River. You can go down and rent a kayak, you can bike along it. There's fishing events that State Parks has been holding. Um, sorry, I went a bit off on a tangent there, but I. I think it's a combination of elected officials, um, government departments, nonprofit organizations like Friends of the LA River and Council for Watershed Health, um, who are at least creating the conversation for the decisions to be made and they look for community input, but it's not, it's not an easy question. I think if your goal is 100%, let's take it back to the way it was, we're not gonna do that without you know, relocating 30 million people. Um, if your goal is to provide an opportunity for people to have access to nature and recreationally fish, maybe you embrace the carp that are there now. So they're tough questions. I don't, I don't necessarily have an answer, at least not <laughs> while I'm wearing my UC hat. <laughs> well, thanks for exploring that. I think that's one of the important issues um, that comes along with the concept of invasive species is that it does involve value judgments. Um, mm -hmm. It involves making decisions with very limited funds to actually do anything. Um, so figuring out which things are, are um, going to be effective at achieving some goal that uh, there's consensus we want to achieve is, is always part of the question. Um, so Yuta, if you don't mind, um, sure. Can you share some of the questions that people have typed in? Yeah, I think um, we did get a couple of questions already addressing that specifically, uh, which is 
the what are the what are the restoration goals? What benefits could be accrued um, by restoring the LA River? And it sounds like you're, you know, you know, it's it's really a, a complex um, goal, and it has to do a lot with um, the setting, the urban setting, and benefits for the people around, as well as sort of making the best of what you got. But do you have anything? Yeah, more to say? Yeah, yeah. And so one of the really neat things that has happened and, and the driving forces behind this were really um, originally Friends of the LA River and the Council for Watershed Health. I saw that Kaz was on the call today. Hi, Kaz. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and um, um, they really pushed, the, there was a recognition that you can't restore a river without restoring the floodplain. And you can't restore the floodplain if you don't own the floodplain. And so people in the LA area may be aware that, you know, in the past, again, decade or so, there's been two new state parks established along the LA River, um, the LA River Historic Park and the LA River State Park. Um, used to be called Chinatown Yards and um, Taylor Yard area. And there's just been um, an effort to restore another section along the LA River and Glassell Park. Um, and they've created natural park areas that are used by, you know, thousands and thousands of people to, to be able to spend some time in nature, even while they might not, you know, have the time or the transportation ability or money that it would take to say, get up to Angeles Forest or even further afield. So yeah. we've already seen a lot of societal benefits. The other thing that I think is really important is to realize that we could be improving um, water quality um, by using, um, especially um, reestablishing native vegetation, but also um, by reestablishing native flow regimes and the opportunities they have to support some of the like microbial communities that again um, Rachel talked about yesterday that can take some of the toxins out of the water can deal with some of those pollutants. So there are ecological benefits, there are societal benefits, there are economic benefits. There's a boom in property values along um, the um, Frogtown area of Los Angeles, for example, which has its own pros and cons. Got it. Yeah. And for anyone who uh, wasn't here yesterday, the talk um, that Sabrina is mentioning is an environmental DNA talk uh, that we had yesterday that will be posted on the UCA and our website as well. I have a, a talk. Uh, I have a question here that I think a, a lot of restorationists um, always battle with um, for a system like this that's associated um, with what you were talking about, are there any new and interesting and permissible approaches for breaking up and altering um, the hard concrete uh, channel bottoms? Ooh, so yeah. I'm, first I'm gonna say absolutely yes. And I've worked with colleagues at the US Bureau of Reclamation on those. And then I'm gonna say, um, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> And so I can only talk about those in vague terms, but the idea really comes down to restoring what we call roughness to the hard concrete channel bottoms in some areas to allow for um, them to function more as say ripples and allow them to have, like I said, some variations in water velocity that benefits um, native fish. And then the other thing is, you know, buying up that floodplain land and being able to actually let the river spread out um, onto those areas. And so that's it's definitely the focus of what's going on along the, the 100 acre park. It's now going to be called connecting that Taylor Yard section up through um, what we now call the Bowtie section in Frogtown. Mm, great. So it doesn't always have to include permeability of the bottom. Um, no, although there are a lot of benefits to restoring permeability to the bottom. And again, it gets back to, you know, sort of what is possible and what is economically feasible and what, you know, how much less sort of flood protection can we afford. Got it. Yeah. 
So then we have a question here specifically about uh, our poor steelhead. So mm -hmm. how are they getting to the upper watershed? <laughs> Didn't seem like they're not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're not. So so this is another uh, Oncorhynchus mycus is just fascinating to me, mm -hmm. and I keep going back to the scientific term because there are genetic differences between um, what we call rainbow trout and what we call steelhead, but it's really a lifestyle difference, right? It's a life history difference. Some populations of Omycus are anadromous and some are not. And what that means is that unlike, say, coho or chinook, I don't believe they can do this. I'm not experts on, an expert on either of those species. Um, Omycus absolutely can complete its entire life cycle without going to the ocean. And so there are Omycus above dams in both the Los Angeles and San Gabriel rivers that are probably the descendants of anadromous steelhead. Oh, that's, yeah. So then the question becomes, do we still call them steelhead or not? But there aren't any steelhead getting from the ocean to the upper watershed right now. We don't have um, fish ladders in the LA River. The problem with a fish ladder has a lot to do with the height of the dam. So you physically need to have, you know, fish can only jump so high. Now, we've got fish ladders at Bonneville Dam, right? That's at Columbia River Dams. Um, and those are huge dams as well. So it's possible to have a fish ladder but it's got to go all the way downstream and a slope that allows it to function as a fish ladder, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. There are also, I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen the fish cannon, <laughs> where they take fish from a, below a dam and actually sort of shoot them over a dam. There are groups that have trucked fish from below a dam to above a dam. Um, and I see that somebody mentioned here a question about um, using underground pipes to have steelhead um, um, move above a dam. Um, again, these are all pretty serious technical challenges. Yeah. So, you know, how you would install a subsurface pipe with breather holes below the LA River, I, I I don't know, <laughs> you know, that would be quite a job. And realize that we're, we're going to have to face at some point whether we're really going to invest money in what they call um, um, conservation um, husbandry, right? Into going into a hatchery and instead of producing sort of rainbow trout as, as quickly and efficiently and cost effectively as they can to support fishing, can we be much more careful and try to produce a fish that we would still call steelhead and reintroduce those that have the, that come from the native gene pool. Mm -hmm. And one big problem is there's so few adults remaining that to risk the life of one to start experimenting is a very tough pill to swallow. Yeah. So on that complicated steelhead front, and do you want to give a, a brief um, explanation uh, about how you can call one species both invasive and uh, native? Oh, absolutely. So, no, it, it's not that they're subspecies. I'm talking about the same. Oh, oh well, so the first thing, the, the simplest answer to that is no species that's invasive to California, none of the weed species that are invasive, not hogweed or spotted knapweed or rundo, they're all native to somewhere, right? It's not a characteristic of the species that it's invasive. It's invasive because we human beings have moved it to a new area um, and it's done really well there and is out competing native species. Now, for the case in California, what I'm saying is we're raising Oncorhynchus mycus in, um, or we have, we've stopped doing this now, raised them in hatcheries and introduced them into waters where there may be native um, steelhead and they're interbreeding. So 
we weren't careful about the genetics of the mm -hmm. stock populations in those hatcheries, or we were, but we chose them for certain characteristics like being fun to fish for, or reproducing quickly, or being disease resistant. Um, not for being native to the system that we're going to introduce them to. And so what you basically have there is a non-native genotype. Yeah. Good. So this is uh, Doug. I just want to acknowledge that we're um, at the one o'clock hour and um, Sabrina will continue to answer questions. And if you're interested in continuing the dialogue, please do a, go ahead and uh, type them into the Q&A and, and listen in. Um, but thank you for joining us for your lunch hour. And uh, we have one more tomorrow. Feel free to register for that. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. And that'll be my colleague from Cooperative Extension, but who works up in Northern California on plants, um, Igor um, Latchin. Excellent. Phytophthora, yes. Yeah. Well, he'll be talking about Phytophthora, his, yeah. his beet, his horticulture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, several uh, more questions here. One of them about uh, Native American tribes and Absolute. their association. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so there are um, uh, Native American tribes, um, who, uh, uh, Tata Viam and um, Tongva um, tribal mm -hmm. members engaged in conservation in the upper watershed, like in the upper Royal Seco area. Um, and then there are um, Native American tribal groups of Chumash peoples who were involved generally throughout Southern California in restoration of steelhead. So those were two different um, um, tribes that sort of an inland um, tribe. They are, sorry, not were, are <laughs> two different tribes um, kind of in the inland mountainous areas and on the coastal areas and both have been um, very much involved. Got it. Uh, switching, switching back to people uh, now, uh, well, uh, this was people, <laughs> um, they, uh, in, in terms of uh, actually switching back to funding specifically, the, uh, there are, you know, a, um, there, is there any opportunity for uh, getting grant funding through perhaps making us a sort of more sustainable uh, environment for uh, just because the LA River can be a food source with its uh, fish. Yeah, so that comes down to determining first whether it's safe to eat fish caught in the LA River or not in terms of contamination. Now we did in our surveys a, a very limited amount of contamination testing and we actually found that levels of things like mercury and PCBs were below levels um, that the EPA would consider um, unsafe so they're they're in the safe levels and that there was a lot of double negatives in there i think um, um and that's what we found was that of the fish that we caught they seemed to have safe levels of a limited number of contaminants it wasn't the base um it, it wasn't what our study was primarily working on and the sample sizes really weren't big enough for me to definitively say yes it's safe to eat fish out of the la river um, but it may not be as dangerous as, as one might think, but it, because there's so little control over runoff, it's hard to get a sense of consistently what water quality is like. The water coming out of the reclamation plants, which is like 85 to 90% of the water in the river, um, it is held to a very high standard and is quite clean. So that's one part of the question. And then the other part of the question is encouraging people to fish down there. So one thing that's, that's, again, another player in all of this is the LA County Department of Public Works and Flood Control District. And they have very much at the heart of their mission protecting people from flooding, which is a very important thing to do. Um, they maybe took that a little further than they needed to. They, for a long time, they were against legally allowing anybody to be in the LA River. They, there's been a shift in recent years such that, you know, we have seasonal um, kayaking allowed, but they're still a little tenuous about it because it's very, very dangerous to be in the LA River during a storm event. Those velocities are really high. And because there aren't a lot of islands and sort of off stream pools, 
you could get in there and get taken to Long Beach and just battered, you know, I mean, they rescue people every year in the winter out of the LA River. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot there, but whether there's funding available, um, there might be, and there's been a lot of involvement from Caltrout and Trout Unlimited in a lot of these projects, trying to restore fishing. I would say we're getting much bigger dollar amounts out of groups like the um, Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government. And fishing is not their primary concern. Ah, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about other uh, local on the ground organizations? Are they, uh, what are opportunities there? Wh which ones are involved in, in helping with the restoration efforts? Ooh, so there's, there's a lot, and I now fear that question a little bit because I'm worried I won't, I'll leave somebody out. So I'm going to try to do my best. I've worked a lot with one of the longest standing um, uh, nonprofits, Friends of the LA River or FOLAR. Um, they're fantastic. Um, there's a group um, centered in Pasadena called Amigos de los Rios, which is involved in restoration in both the LA and San Gabriel rivers. Um, there's agencies, um, both in the upper watershed, certainly the um, U.S. Forest Service is very involved and they have volunteer programs people can get involved with. Um, and then along a lot of the river, there's the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, MRCA, and California State Parks, and they have volunteer opportunities. Um, I noticed, hi, Melanie, that Melanie Winters here and asked a question from the River Project, which is a river um, group who's um, headquartered in the San Fernando Valley and does work throughout the river, but certainly a lot in that, in those sections of the river. I'm okay. gonna stop there, but I promise That's you I've left a lot of people out. Aquarium in the Pacific mm -hmm. has been really helpful down towards the estuary. Um, um, Friends of Los Cerritos Lagoon down there. Oh boy, there's so many groups. <laughs> Do you have uh, links to some of those groups, at least uh, at, from your website? I have links to some of them, I believe, if they've actually funded my research. Um, but again, it gets a little check. <laughs> I'd have to really make sure I've gotten them all and not just some. Oh, and I should mention that Heal the Bay and LA Riverkeeper have been very involved and are always looking for volunteers as well. So Heal the Bay has worked all the way up through the river, but certainly their focus in the past has been down towards the estuary. And well, you know, when people hear the bay in Heal the Bay, they think of the Santa Monica Bay. They also do work in San Pedro Bay, which is the, the name of the bay in Long Beach. Um, and then there is an LA Riverkeeper who does a lot of work on both um, um, monitoring water quality and then fighting in the political context for better um, for improvements and investment from water quality. Ah, that's, that's great. Um, and uh, on that vein of water quality, what about, um, what about reducing, you know, what, what, what's being done to reduce the non-point source pollution from residential neighborhoods? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, a lot of this gets into sort of the land use planning arena. Um, one of the, um, I think, most important things that happen is building on the federal Clean Water Act and the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, MPDES. Yes. Um, the city and county of LA also have what are called MS4 permits that have to do with improving water quality in the river. Um, they do a lot of public education, but they also do things like requiring all new development to um, have the capacity to store the first three quarters inches of rainfall from any given storm on site so that it ideally sinks into the soil where it's fallen and gets kind of cleaned up by that filtration going through the soil and also recharges the aquifer. Um, a lot of it's public education, not using a lot of chemicals on your lawn, not pouring things down storm drains. Um, if you change your oil, make sure you're collecting the oil. If you wash your car, try to collect that or go to a car wash because they're required to collect the soapy water that comes off cars and then reducing trash and participating in things like the the LA River um, La Grande Limpieza, the big the great cleanup that 
um, Friends mm. of the LA River does every year. And many other groups do that too. You can look for Coastal Cleanup Day in September. Um, there's always a lot of events, not just at the coast, but all the way up into our watersheds. Um, and um, around Earth Day, there's a lot of groups doing it. And then there's groups that do um, trash cleanups all the time. But one good way to find them is by looking to see who's posted opportunities around Earth Day and um, Coastal Cleanup Day. Great. Uh, we have three more questions, so I think we can we can power through these. Um, right. So we have uh, someone interested in whether other uh, other watersheds in Southern California um, that are similarly impacted are part of this conversation too. Absolutely, absolutely. Basically, all watersheds in Southern California. So. Um, those permit processes that I mentioned, they're, they sound a little arcane, NPDES and NS4, but what, that, what those permits mean in reality is that city and county government has to take steps to improve water quality. And so almost all of the city and county government, either flood protection or watershed protection or um, stormwater agencies, have activities that they're doing. Um, there's an effort to develop watershed, integrated watershed management plans for every watershed in California, including those in Southern, Southern California. Um, there's really um, well-organized groups um, um, like throughout the Santa Ana River watershed and, and then going up north, the Santa Clara and Ventura River watersheds. In Southern Orange County, where it's the smaller coastal streams, I might look into um, um, Orange County Coast Keeper and, and track some of the work that they're doing for ways to get involved or learn more about those watersheds. Got it. So we had uh, an attendee really interested in how specific uh, some of the um, stormwater uh, reclamation um, activities are in the LA River area. Is so this are a there question from Katie so M? Katie M. Okay, yeah, exactly. Look at that. Yeah, the 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 bottom part of that, which is how uh, and where is flow most valuable, um, and has that been sort of identified and shared with people? Ah, we're identifying it right now. So one group who I should have mentioned who didn't mention, who does a lot of work on. The more technical side of restoration in the LA River is called the Southern California, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking here, Sport, Southern California Coastal Waters Research Project and Eric Stein's group down there um, and Raphael Mazur and, and other folks down there. And um, I'm on a technical advisory team for a study that they're lead, um, leading right now, which is developing um, levels and areas for um, what we call environmental flows for the LA River, figuring out how much flow ought to be kept in the river to support species that we're interested in continuing to support. Because it's definitely, yeah, water, flood water used to be seen, <laughs> the Council for Watershed Health, which used to be the LA and San Gabriel Rivers Watershed Council, put out a great book many years ago called stormwater asset, not liability. And they're right, it used to be thought of as a, um, as a um, uh, liability, as something you know, that was a danger that we had to get rid of as fast as possible. And now the tides have sort of shifted and there's a lot of groups interested in using reclaimed water and we're trying to decide, oh, wait a minute, if we start using all of that reclaimed water we're actually getting to the point where we're um, um, taking away areas where flow might be needed. So establishing, again, what the, the technical term for it is um, minimum environmental flows is the goal of that project. And it's underway right now. It should be done pretty soon. And when it is, you can find a little more information about the project at my website. But when the reports are actually issued, I'll be posting links to those at my website too. That's really helpful. Um, well, you have one more question. Okay, it's maybe another you can big read one. one. <laughs> and for someone very, very knowledgeable yeah. about the LA River, she's been working yeah. on conserving the LA River um, longer than I have. <laughs> right. Uh huh. Okay. So yeah, here we're looking at um, larger 
uh, conservation goals and whether they are going to be helping to uh, would be at providing additional justification to right so so I'll just I'll read her question really yeah. quickly because I need to read it to answer it but also for people who can't see it moving people out of floodplains in order to create habitat for native fish would definitely be tough to justify but what if the goals are not limited to restoring conditions for native fish but also increasing overall biodiversity sequestering carbon recharging groundwater improving water quality and ensuring public safety during inevitable extreme storm events. That's great. So, so, you know, the quick name for that, for those of you not immersed in this is multi-benefit um, or multi-use um, conservation plans. And um, then the question is, you know, don't the economics work then or is the basin study for conservation wrong? I absolutely think that the economics does work out. And I think, again, whether the economics works out is a political question. Oh, the economics of moving people out of floodplains. Um, well, there's an economic cost and a social cost to that. And unfortunately, until gentrification runs its course, it's some of our lowest income community members who are going to um, suffer some of the greatest impacts. Um, I think it's important to think through that and think about where, you know, what could be offered to people to encourage them to move out of floodplains. So um, one really fascinating study of urban rivers um, or, or case study for restoration of urban rivers is the Chongichon River in South Korea, in Seoul. Um, they had undergrounded it, they buried it over, put the whole flow into pipes and built a freeway on top of it, went right through the heart of Seoul. Mm. They decided that they were going to restore it. And again, restoration is limited to, you know, what you can do. So in some areas, there's, there's what looks like, you know, native aquatic habitat. In other areas, it's um, sort of concrete stepped banks that have, um, you know, chessboards integrated into them and dance areas and, and really are restoring a lot of the social function of the river. Um, they move people out and in South Korea, in that city at that time with enough money available, that was considered socially acceptable. These are political questions. <laughs> yeah. About not just, you know, how much would it cost to move everybody, but who has the right to move everyone? Certainly it's been done before. Um, and some people would say that, you know, we should move half the people out of New Orleans, but you're coming up against an American ideal of private property rights there too. So I don't think I answered your question. I don't know, Melanie, if you really expected me to, <laughs> but it's a very interesting and important conversation to be having. And a difficult question to end with. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for the questions. Thank you. You are very welcome. I'm curious to see. We've still got 37 diehard participants here with us. Oh, 36 now. People are leaving. <laughs> I just wanted to thank everybody for um, coming to this and all the previous um, sessions and um, hope to see you all tomorrow for Igor's talk. Actually, so I, unfortunately, I won't be able to be here for it tomorrow as I'll be facilitating a conversation about national goals for climate resilience. Um, but uh, Doug, did you have anything to add there? Oh, uh, thank you so much for a great talk and for helping to put together this series. Um, and we'll miss you tomorrow. Have a great talk on resilience. Um, thank you to everyone who attended. Um, have a great rest of your Thursday and we'll hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. And I just want to thank Doug for the original idea for this series um, two years, three years ago. Our pleasure. It's great collaboration. Yeah. Take care. Thanks.